So the first reading from the Old Testament is from Psalm 15, and it's called A Psalm of David. Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? The one whose way of life is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart, whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbour and casts no slur on others, who despises a vile person but honours those who fear the Lord, who keeps an oath even when it hurts and does not change their mind. Who lends money to the poor without interest? Who does not accept a bribe against the innocent? Whoever does these things will never be shaken. So the second reading is from James 3, 1 to 12, Taming the Tongue. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal, or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the course of one's life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father and with it we curse human beings who've been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. We have seen thee, Queen of Cheese, lying quietly at your ease, gently fanned by evening breeze, the fair form no flies dare seize. All gaily dressed soon you'll go to the great provincial show to be admired by many a beau in the city of Toronto. Thankfully, that's not one of my poems. It's James McIntyre, Ode on the Mammoth Cheese. Maybe you'll prefer these next words I say. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Well, it's Genesis 1, 1 to 3, of course. 
Words can be powerful, can't they? They can evoke emotions out of us, whether cheesy emotions or word, you know, emotions of wonder, like from Genesis. How do we tame our tongues? Three points to share with you today. The first point is our tongues can be used for good or evil. Number two, what is happening when we use our tongues badly? And three, what can we do to reset our words? So let's go straight to point one. Our tongues can be used for good or for evil. Now, we have a heavy-duty muscle and power in our mouths. And that heavy-duty muscle is called a tongue. And when we unleash this beast from its cage... Our tongues can do great and magnificent things, and they can do things we're not proud of. Wouldn't you agree? We always have a choice in what we say and do with our tongues. For example, don't we love hearing these words? I love you, Mum and Dad. Thanks for doing that. It's a girl. Lord, please help my family to know you and trust you as Lord and Saviour. The tongue can bring words of life and hope to us, can't it? And through us too. In Proverbs chapter 10, verse 11, it says, The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life. And then Proverbs chapter 16, verse 24 says, Gracious words are a honeycomb. Sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. That's true, isn't it? You and I were blessed by someone speaking the very words of life to us, the good news of Jesus Christ. So our tongues can do great, great good, pardon me, and even bring life to others. But it's no secret that the tongue is the most powerful voluntary muscle you and I have. So we need to use it wisely. For example, here in James 3, James starts off addressing here those who would want to be Bible teachers. And he says to those people, if you want to be a teacher, be extra careful with how you use your tongue. And he was saying that because there were teachers who used the privilege of teaching God's flock to actually mouth off at their enemies, even Enemies who may have been at church where they were speaking. Oh dear. Well, can I say to you this morning, let this not discourage you from being a teacher of God's word. We need more teachers. But preach Christ crucified and teach Christ crucified, not yourself. And your tongue needs to be on its best behaviour when you're a teacher. You are judged more strictly, James says, because... As a teacher, you direct entire groups of believers one way or another, towards God or away from him. Now, our tongues, James says, act like a bit does for a horse or a rudder on a ship. If you're an equestrian, and and there are some in our congregations, you're the one who manoeuvres horses through those demanding jumps and over impossibly high barriers just through the use of that tiny metal bit controlling even the horse's minute movements. Many of you have been on those massive uh, passenger cruise ships too, and some of those ships have up to 5,000 or more people on them. They power on from one great port to another, directed by these relatively small rudders. Now the tongue is like that too. It can be used for good, Or, James says, it can be a restless evil, full of deadly poison. That's verse 8 there in chapter 3. Now, poison, as we know, it spreads through the bloodstream to the entire body from wherever its little point of entry is. It's usually a very tiny point of entry. Same with the poison of bad words. When they come out of our mouths and that small muscle, they affect not just us, those words if they're evil but also they affect other people unfairly and ungraciously 
Now those kinds of words that we may say poison not only us, as I said, but other people. All because of this little flappy thing operated by an unloving heart. Now when we let rip with our words or we use our words to sully other people's good name, we set off, James says, a raging forest fire, if you like, a fire around us. And it causes major damage. Now, a few years ago in Western Australia, there was a policeman. He was off duty at the time and he was using a grinding tool um, in the hot January summer in the open air. And as he was grinding, he set off a little spark. The grinder did anyway. And within a short and relatively short amount of time, over 440 hectares of bushland was destroyed by fire. 40 homes, 20 sheds and carports, and also even a bridge. James says, the tongue has that same capacity for damage to us and others. He says in verse 8, no one can tame the tongue. And you get a sense of this elsewhere in the scriptures too. In Proverbs chapter 15, verse 4, a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. Isn't that true? The tongue is a small muscle, but when we speak poorly of others or we boast of ourselves at another's expense or just hurt people, our tongue becomes a fire starter. Unkind words, sometimes even said just in playful jest, if we're not careful, can destroy fellowship with one another. We can cause untold damage when we choose to use language of war, for example, too, when we're trying to heal a damaged relationship. James says our tongues can set the whole course of our lives on fire in verse 6 there. We can hurt others, hurt ourselves, and especially hurt God, his good name, and our Christian witness to those around us. So the tongue can be used for good or evil. Point two, what's happening when we use our tongues, and especially badly? What is going on when we're unkind and vicious with our words? Well, those sort of words are usually a symptom of a sick heart that needs the Lord's healing. And our hearts, you know, and our heart of faith can be diagnosed often by the speech that comes out of our mouths. As Jesus says in Matthew chapter 15, verse 18 and 19. But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. James says himself in verses 9 and 10, With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth, same mouth, pardon me, comes praise and cursing. And James says this shouldn't be for a disciple of Jesus. Because Jesus has redeemed our tongues, our whole lives, and the Holy Spirit himself lives in us. Now in Belrose, I'm sure as with anywhere else, I'm sure we've heard and said thoughtless things over time. Ministers' tongues have destructive power too, just like the next person. And what's not great about a wayward tongue also is that God knows our words before we do. So there's nowhere to hide from God. He hears our words. Do you remember Psalm 139 in, in verse 4 says, Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. So our final point today, what can we do to reset the way we use our words? Because with the freedom we have in Jesus, the new life we have in him, the eternal life he's promised us, we now have and it's secure. We also have a responsibility and the wisdom of Christ in how we're to use our words and, and our tongues. Because when we pay out others, perhaps we've forgotten to see the image of God in them, even with their faults or our frustrations with them. So we need really the self-realisation of the prophet Isaiah in our lives. When he realised in Isaiah 6 verse 5, 
Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a person of unclean lips. Think about your conversations recently. What's been the overall pattern of how you've used your words in the recent past? Have your words been generally loving in conversations? Have they built up others? Have they been generous? Have they been okay when you've stopped to think about it? Or have they been a bit barky or a bit mean or a bit cold? Have your words been starting fires recently? If that's the case, then James says, this ought not to be so. And he would like you to move towards consistent, kind, truthful, necessary words. Words are symptoms really of our heart condition, aren't they? And how we're going with our saviour. So even before that, the only way we're really ever going to reset poor patterns of words and how we use them is to bring that symptom to our saviour and say, Lord, please heal me of the sickness in my heart. Share, share your, your concerns with him because he cares for you. We need the forgiveness of Christ, don't we, when we've used our words badly. Or as James said in the beginning of his letter, we need to go back to the mirror regularly to remember what we look like and who we are by God's amazing grace shown to us through Jesus. So look, here's a quick test for deciding what words to use if you ever think about it. If you're about to say something and you're not, you're not sure whether to say it, just think, look, are these words true? Are they gracious? Are they kind? Even when I'm in disagreement with someone, will my humour even pan out well for this person? Am I seeing the image of God in the person I'm going to be talking to? Is what I'm about to say necessary um, in that moment? Don't forget what James says in chapter 1 as well. He says, be slow to speak, be quick to listen. Now, God knows we're not going to be perfect in this area. We will stumble. But this is great wisdom from James, isn't it? It's great wisdom from God. Move towards taming the tongue. How, James says? Well, let God's word do God's work in our lives and in our hearts. Receive the implanted word, James 1.21 says. And let all the glory go to God with how we speak and how we treat other people.